Hey everybody, I want to remind you of the different ways that you could send your tithes and your offering. You could do it through texting. If you don't have access to Google Play or the App Store, just send a text to 601-273-4609 and send it to the word GIVE. After that, you'll receive a text message back and then just follow the simple instructions, the simple steps, and you're all set up. Also, you can use the Tidely app. Just download the app from the Google Play or the App Store, and you can set up the amount that you want to give, and you can send it to Springs of Praise World Outreach Center, or you can mail it to Post Office Box 549, Crystal Springs, Mississippi, 39059. If you want to drop it off at the uh, church office, the office is open Tuesdays through Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. And as always, I want to thank you for watching this program. Exposing the enemy's end time strategy, but I'm just looking forward. I have a, a large word from the Lord. Are you ready for a lot of word? Yeah. Father, anoint our minds and our spirits to receive divine revelation. Let us receive the power of that word that ignites and, and, and excites us. That thing that lifts us up out of the cloud of the muck and the mire of society and the battles and struggles. And let us see clearly with your perspective what you are saying to us and the victory that you have for us. For we are not going down, we are going up. This is not another year of struggle and defeat. It's a year of being on top. No matter what the circumstances, you are releasing a new strength into the body of Christ and we are about to see the fulfillment of the breakthrough of intercession of prayers of many years for you have not given up on America yet something is about to happen and we declare it in Jesus name amen I want you to open your Bibles to second Timothy chapter 2 beginning with verse 3 and it was really amazing this morning as I had already been preparing to deal with three battle areas of warfare that we are in, but then I saw it laid out in this verse so clearly, and I said, well, there it is. So I really want you, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 7, I want you to write that down, notate it, circle it, something to remember to go back to it, because we are in a season and and seasons, unlike anything we have experienced, most of us experienced, at least for a long time here in this country, and in some ways in areas that we've never experienced before. And a lot of people, we keep waiting it to go back to normal, and as soon as it seems like things are getting better, something else rises up. Right, right after I left here last time, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. He told me COVID wasn't over yet. He said the biggest wave is about to come. But he said, be not afraid of it. It's a cleansing wave. Hallelujah. And something I did not know, Omicron had not even come out yet. But Omicron, although it's highly, much more highly of infectious, it is much less deadly. And it's actually causing a natural immunity to be hitting on many, many, many people. So I believe that the Omicron is actually part of the answer. It's why Europe is suddenly shifting out of pandemic mode into endemic mode. And the only ones that are still in pandemic mode are those that are driven to keep more control over the people. Yeah. In fact, I spoke prophetically. I saw a, a video I did in 2014 when the, the Ebola outbreak was happening in Africa and then a few in the United States. And people were freaking out over that. In fact, we took a team to Kenya of eight members. I had people go on Facebook from our church bashing me for risking taking people into Africa because they had Ebola over in Africa. Well, the place they had Ebola was 3,000 miles away from where we were going. But fear causes people to pull back. Fear causes people to think, not think rationally. In fact, I thought it was a little humorous because the day we landed in Kenya, an Ebola case showed up 10 miles from my church <laughs> in, in Texas. I said, you were, more you were closer to Ebola than I was. But I said something, I said the reason they're hyping it up into a crisis is because they use it to take governmental control and authority in areas they couldn't control before. The church of Jesus Christ is the answer. We are the salt. We are the light. In fact, we, in that documentary we watched, to Communist China did a 20-year intensive study to try to figure out why is America so prosperous? Why is it so bountiful? They first looked at our military might, and they decided, no, that's not it. 
Then they looked at our economic might and ability and ingenuity. They said, no, that's not it. They, they looked at every area of business and industry, they, political, our political system, and the way we do elections when they used to be fair, and that's not it. And they looked at that, and finally they came, the communist China came down to a summary. They said, the one thing is why America, after 20 years of research, is America so prosperous is because of the Christian church. Yes, amen. Yeah. They said, that's it. Yeah. Bar none, they said, there's no debate amongst us about this. Amen. The communist China recognized that the church of Jesus Christ is the reason America is blessed. Yeah. Yeah. And so no wonder the devil, and you must realize this, everything that's happening on the global stage is designed to come after the church. Right. They may go after this one and they may go after that one, but they're, they're ultimately trying to go after the church. Yeah. But I got news for the devil. He's already lost. Yeah. I read somewhere and I said, oh yeah. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But I want us to get into an offensive mind instead of a defensive mind. Because it, often when we think of the gates of hell, we think defensively. And we think of the, almost, we don't think it this way, but... We picture it like devil, the hell is coming after us. The devil's coming after us, but he won't prevail. The gates aren't marching gates. Amen. Gates are things that keep something locked behind and something locked out. The strongholds, the assignments of the enemy are no match for the forceful, moving, powerful army of Jesus Christ. We are not to be in a defensive position. You cannot win a warfare on offense, on defense, excuse me. I'm going to say it again. We're not in a defensive position. You cannot win warfare from a defensive posture. Amen. Let us go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and through 7. Therefore, you therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier. Are we, we're not going to have scriptures up. That I'm going to do that? Okay. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 7. You, therefore, every say, must endure. Must endure. Must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I got news for you. You are a soldier, not a citizen. Yeah. Or not just a citizen. You are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but you are also a soldier. Yeah. Amen. 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 You say, I didn't want to be. It doesn't matter. You are. Amen. You've done been drafted. Your number, number came up. Jesus called you, filled you with the Holy Ghost. You are a soldier. We are engaged in a battle. We are engaged in the battle of the ages. There is a divine destiny of God upon America. We are the only nation formed from the birth of Jesus ever formed for one purpose and the main purpose, which was for the expression of free worship to God and the evangelism of the world. America has a unique place in the heart of God. Do not, that is why the enemy is fighting and trying to convince our children that America is not a good place. America was birthed in racism. America is a bad place. No, we are divinely anointed and appointed by God, and we are a vital part of the end time purposes. Amen. Come on, amen. amen. We made covenant when the pilgrims came over, they made covenant with God. That this, is a, this land is dedicated for the worship of God and the advancement of the gospel. And God holds true to the covenant. Amen. He blessed this nation because of that covenant. And we hang on to that covenant. Amen. And we lay claim to that covenant. Amen. So he says, we're in a battle though. The enemy needs to destroy the globalists, the demonic forces, the antichrist spirit, and ultimately the antichrist, they need to, they feel they need to destroy America, and the way to destroy America is to destroy the church. Amen. And if you destroy the church, then all of demonic, all wickedness begins to rise. So he speaks to us three areas, three areas of instruction, three areas of warning that the enemy is trying to release upon the church of Jesus Christ, but we are overcoming. He gives us three areas to look at. Let's look at verse 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, yes. that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So the first area is the area of distractions. 
The enemy is a master of distracting people. He gets us distracted by entertainments. We've never lived, there's never been a society like this society we've lived in the last few decades where there is so much entertainment. I just, I lived down in Florida, not far from Disney World, and I went into Disney World. January used to be dead season. I mean, you could just walk on, on every ride. It is absolutely packed out. I mean, just packed everywhere with people pushing and fighting in the happiest place on earth just to get their ride. I mean, people, I mean, it's, they're aggressive and rude. But there, there's so many entertainment distractions. But I want to deal with an area particularly. Distractions. The word entanglement, that you don't get entangled himself in the affairs of this life. I want to define for a minute what that is and what's not. The word entangled means to become, become involved in some task or role to the point that it interferes with a more important activity. I'm going to say that again. See, it's not wrong to go see a movie, the right kind of movie. <laughs> It's not wrong to, to, to go have a nice meal out. It's not wrong to go have a little vacation. But here's the thing. Have you become entangled and involved in tasks or things to the point that it interferes with the most important thing? Yes. See, it's some people and this demonic philosophy that is embedded into the church told church people, they took even this scripture and other scriptures and they said, hey, you're not to be entangled in politics. That's the affairs of this life. Uh -oh, Y'all hear me? Yeah. You're not to be entangled in, 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 in building businesses because that's the affairs of this life. That's where we got monks from. And that's where we got people that pulled themselves out. That's not what this thing is saying. Amen. He's saying don't be entangled in those things that don't further the kingdom of heaven. But I'm going to show you in a moment how being involved politically, how being involved in your local community is absolutely a part of the commission of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Come on, what's the old adage? Evil thrives when good men do nothing. The reason many of God's people, one of the reasons many of God's people become entangled in the affairs of this life is because they are not engaged in the eternal warfare. They want to be citizens, but they don't want to be soldiers. A soldier is engaged in warfare. A citizen can suffer. Now, listen to me carefully. A citizen can suffer the consequences of warfare, but they're not engaged in fighting the war. See, some people say, well, it's such a spiritual battle because they're suffering the consequences of critical race theory. They're suffering the consequences of the radical gay agenda. They're suffering the consequences of Christian economic persecution. They're suffering the consequences of not wanting to take the jab. Are you all with me on this? They're suffering the consequences. But they're saying, oh, I'm engaged in such warfare. No, you're simply collateral damage. You're not engaged in warfare until you are the, on the offense going after the wickedness that is producing those things. Oh, boy, this is quiet now. Come on, are you hearing me? Because citizens can get bombed too. But the soldier has weapons to fight back. And so often the church, we've been sitting back, oh, it's so terrible. Oh, look what they've done. They're teaching our children, having transgender people come in. They're telling our children to question their gender identity. Even the people who claim that we don't believe science don't believe the science. And they're in there. And now and you're shamed and you're mocked and they're trying to cancel you. If you dare say, hey, you know, there's something funny with some of these vaccines. Oh, my goodness. They cancel you. They call you liars. Even though you can be a world-renowned virologist, but it doesn't matter. And so often the church is like, oh, what can we do? Oh, what can we do? Oh, what can we do? No, I'm telling you, we are the army of God. I said we are the army of God. But we have got to make sure that we're fighting the battle and we're fighting the right battle. The right battle can be fought in natural things, but it must be fought for eternal purposes. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. The right battle can be bought in, fought in what we call natural things, but it's being fought for eternal purposes. When Wilberforce in England fought for, what, 50 years to help stop the slave trade in England. 
He was being driven by God, driven by the Spirit of God. He was fighting in the political realm for any, a, a spiritual, eternal purpose. Are you all hearing me on that? We need to understand that. Now, you can get all caught up in just fighting political realm battles to fight political battles. And that's where you get trapped in to become married to a political party and often follow them even when they go to ungodly directions. But if you're fighting the spiritual battle, you're not married to the political party. You're married to the principles that this or that party may be espousing. But you have to understand it through God's perspective. All right, all right, now don't. Yeah. Colossians 3, 23. 3, 2, and 3, sorry. Colossians 3, 2, and 3. Now, please, just stay with me on this. I'm not going to be talking politics the whole time or anything like that. I'm just dealing. We're in a war. Amen. Don't get distracted by the entertainment. Don't get distracted by the virus. Do you know how many people got distracted by the virus? There's people that are still hiding. Two years into this, I'm hiding, I'm hiding. Ooh, and I hadn't got my house yet. Well, okay, great. I hadn't got your house yet, but how many people are going to hell in the time frame? Oh my, my, my. Mm. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. Again, it doesn't mean you don't focus on business and politics. You don't focus on caring for people. Of course we do. All of those things are in Scripture. But our focus is we're focused on the eternal plan. We're focused on the eternal purpose. The reason we want the principles of the kingdom of God in our laws and in our governments and in our schools is because it produces the blessing of God. It brings people to Christ. And it pushes away, away the forces of darkness and wickedness. He said, for you died. It's no longer about you and me. You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. Are you all with me? Because I'm about to warm up. <laughs> for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Whew. I want to start with that. The love of money. The love of money, it doesn't mean you're like, oh, I love it, I love it, I love it. The love of money is a wrong emotional relationship with money. If you have a wrong emotional relationship, it didn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money is the, is the root of all kinds of evil. And many have pierced themselves through. Many have strayed. I thought this was interesting. Many have strayed from the faith producing because of greediness. I said to preacher when he showed up, I said, you know, I heard a great message, a pastor. I really like him and he's very funny and anointed. And, and, and we attend his church uh, when I'm there in Florida. But I said, I said when he gets on the issue of faith, he, he's got a strong word. But I said, have you ever noticed that almost all the preaching of faith is one of two things? It's either faith for finances or faith for healing. Right. Have you ever noticed that? And I said, I said, I thought to myself, most of it's finances, about 70% finances, probably about 28% for physical healing. And then probably 2% is everything else. But what's happened in the church is because the focus became on material wealth so much, we became distracted even in the purpose of the gospel and the blessings of God for that I have a new car, new house, new things, nice furniture, nice vacations, that that love of that wrong emotional relationship with money, that wrong focus on the money, on the wealth, has actually caused us to depart from the faith. Amen. It is not really us exercising faith. Because if we're exercising faith, you'll have everything you need for every good work. Not just everything you need for everything you want. What is what? But if you're not working. Oh, no, that's quiet now. If you're not working, God wants to bless you so you can be a blessing. The purpose for the abundance is not so we live in comfort far beyond most of the world. The purpose for the abundance is so we can present and bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. Yes. It's so we can do more good works. Right. Nothing wrong with you having nice things, but the nice things is not what it's about. Yes. We hear people say it's fine to have nice things. Don't let nice things have you. 
But there's a seductiveness to it. And so much of the preaching in the church. Why has the church become so weak? Why it become so distracted? Because we exercise more faith for a new car than we do for the soul that we saw on the street that was dying and going to hell. We say, I can believe God for a new car, but I can't believe deliverance for my son, my son or my daughter. I can't believe deliverance for the neighbor or the guy on the street. I can't believe for revival to hit my city and to come back to my church time and again. We sit back and we wait as spectators, as citizens, kind of hoping maybe the blessing will flow over. But when it comes to our financial needs, boy, yeah, we'll give a thousand, I get ten thousand back. Woo! Yes, let's do it. And that happens at times. Glory be to God. I'm not critical of that. But the focus has become so much of that, we become distracted by the trappings of what looks like the blessing of God. But the real blessing of God has got to be the sons and the daughters that are gathered to your side. Amen. The family of God that is growing because you showed up. Yes, amen. Yes. Woo! When you get to heaven, you're not going to point to a mansion. You're not going to point to a successful business. You're going to, the only thing that you're going to be able to see is who did I help grow in God? Who did I help lift him up? Who did I help get saved? Who did I strengthen? Who are the sons and daughters of my life? Yes, true. Yes. Many have strayed from the faith because even in the church, they got our focus off of a sacrificial life. For the advancement of the kingdom into a self-serving life. It's all about me. And if you don't preach about my blessing, if you don't sing about my blessing, if you don't sing about me, I'm gone. We bring a prophecy meeting with some famous prophet that you're looking forward to him telling you your problems are all over and you're going to be blessed within the next three months. The place will be packed. You call for a prayer meeting for salvation in the souls of your city and it's... Become distracted not only by the worldly things but even many people in the church we become distracted by the misrepresentation of certain biblical principles to the exaltation over the main core issues we're more, we'd rather take our kids to the church that has Disneyland for their children's class than bring them to a place where their hands are laid on them and they're told, taught how to prophesy and walk in the word of God Verse 11, but you, O man of God, flee these things. Run away and pursue. Every say pursue. pursue. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Let me back off of that. Say it again. Say pursue. pursue. That pursue doesn't mean just to go after. That pursue literally means to put to fight or fight for. Don't be distracted. The soldier is not engaged, entangled in the affairs of this life, in the, the, the things of this life that are not about the fight. You fight for righteousness. Come on, huh? The world is trying to shame the church. Shut up about homosexuality. Shut up about multigenderism and transgender. Shut up about critical race theory. Shut up about all of these things which are rooted in a communist agenda. And I'm telling you, you've got to understand this. This is the demonic, ungodly, atheistic agenda to destroy the power of the church. It promises fairness, but it does not provide it. Oh, I'm, I'm going I'm to hit that. I'm jumping ahead. Everybody say fight for Fight for righteousness. And what is righteousness? It's not how the world defines it. Righteousness is the character, equality of the character of God. Yeah. Fight for righteousness. Fight for godliness. Yeah. Fight for faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Real faith. Fight for agape love. Yeah. Not human love. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Fight for patience. That patient endurance and the gentleness. Whoa. Fight. Exercise your faith. Don't get so distracted by all the hysteria of the negative that you end up just lashing out at everything. That's good. Come, are y'all with me on this? Come on. Am I, are you guilty? Don't read your eyes. I'm guilty. Yeah. 
It's like you, you, get, you see all the news reports and all the things that are keep going on. And the Lord said, no, no, no. Don't get distracted by all that. Don't get caught up in the human way of fighting it. Fight it in the spirit and fight it with my kingdom principles. Yeah. Fight it with righteousness. Fight it with godliness. Fight it with heavenly patience and godly gentleness. Yeah. Fight it the way Jesus would fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. Grab on to that right now. Your eternal life does not begin when you die. Eternal life is in you right now. The kingdom of heaven is in you right now. Lay hold of that eternal life. Get your focus back on eternity. Are you all with me Get your focus on eternity. Fight for that. Because when you're on an eternal focus, then all of these troubles and battles, hey, they were going through it. They were going through it worse than we're going through it. They were going through it, but all those things take a proper perspective. Don't be distracted by the entertainments and the seductions. Don't be Pinocchio. Don't go to, what was that island called? Pleasure Island. Don't spend all your time on Pleasure Island, but also don't get distracted by the intensity of the lies of the enemy where you start feeling overwhelmed. Be focused on eternity. Jesus is coming back. He will conquer all the kingdoms of the earth. He will slay them with the breath of his mouth. His garment will be literally covered in blood as he treads down, you know, like a, in a wine press, the, the wicked and the ungodly. He will set up his kingdom here on this earth. It is coming. So lay a hold of eternity now. No matter what, we know wickedness is going to rise. We know that there's going to be demonic end time spirit of lying. They refer to it in one place in scripture in Thessalonians as lying wonders. The Bible says that even the Antichrist and that spirit will be given power to blaspheme. It was supernatural anointing to fight against the things of God. But we are not shook because we've laid a hold of eternity. And we're not going to be distracted by how much it seems like the enemy is winning because he is losing. Hallelujah. Huh? Because I've seen more people. I just think I lost. Yep, that thing's blinking. Where's batteries? I've seen so many people get so wound up by the, the, the lies that are happening. That they have no joy anymore. Huh? They have no joy anymore. They have no peace. They, they, they're just like, it's, it's like you, the conversation with them, nothing but complaining about what's happening. That's being entangled in the affairs of this life. No, we are going to be wrapped up in bringing the victory. We know that the power of the gospel has the power to break through any lie of the enemy. That's why they want to shame you into being quiet. Don't you dare get quiet. Don't you dare shut your mouth. His word in your mouth shall not return void. Woo. Watch what he says. Let's say go Isaiah. Isaiah 26 verse 3. Drink real quick. Isaiah 26 verse 3. You keep him in perfect peace. Thanks. I'll just put it there. Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Our mind is stayed on him, on who he is, and on what he is focused on, Amen. which is the end of the age. God told me three things are coming this year. I don't know if they'll fully be fulfilled this year, or start this year, but three major upheavals. You say, more? Oh, yeah. Remember, I prophesied to you. You were the first place. Two years ago, I stood in this pulpit. December 29th. God spoke to me on December 28th. December 29th of 2019. And the Lord told me, tell my people, the decade of the 20s is going to be a decade of extremes. How many of you know that's, that's happening? Yes. We're, we're, I mean, we're, we're on the verge of going to war with Russia over, you can't even pronounce their name. 
Ukraine and, and, and whoever, they, uh, over nothing. Why? Because the, the militarized industrial complex, they want war. The, pow the globalist powers, they want war because that always enriches them and drains the people. They always want this. We see all the things going on. Three major upheavals, he said, is coming this year. Number one, a major in the United States political upheaval. Major political upheaval. Second, a major economic upheaval. And third, a major biological upheaval. But I'm telling you, the Lord told me, tell my people, be at peace. Because I'm in this. I'm actually, these upheavals are actually going to produce something godly. Now, I know you want me to come here like the beginning of the year prophets and say, oh, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> In 2022, everything's going to be new. <laughs> you know, as long as you give that $2,022 gift. Y'all yeah, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? All the stuff that goes on. But I'm telling you, these things are coming. But we are in a battle. We are in a war. But be at peace. When your mind is stayed focused on who he is and his eternal plan, that he is working all things together for good, that you can be at perfect peace. Everybody else is freaking out. And you're like, it's cool. I am at peace. See, some people say, well, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. But that is an incorrect, ungodly statement. <laughs> The correct statement is you are to be so heavenly minded that now you become earthly good. Right. Let's go the second one. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Turn me back up just a hair because I'm I'll, I'll pull this back. <clears throat> and also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The second area where the enemy is attacking the church, the first area is distractions. The second area is deception. He is trying to rewrite the rules. He is trying to change the word of God and the meanings of the word of God, thus robbing the church of its power. He says, run, but you have to run according to the rules. Ever said the rules? If you listen to a lot of the modern church preaching that has come out today, a lot of it is basically there are no rules for the Christian. Brother Steve, we're under grace. Jesus paid for it all, so we're under grace, so I can play all over the place. I can do whatever I want to do, however I want to do it. It doesn't matter. God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. And so we start. The, the world philosophies have crept in. Second Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says this. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. How many of you know God's wisdom is higher than man's wisdom? That the natural man does not understand the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned. But we've allowed the philosophy, we've allowed the world to redefine key Christian terms. Three areas in modern society of the basic principles of the world that have fell, fallen into the church. Number one, man's concept of love. We all run around and say God is love, God is love. But we've allowed the world to redefine that to say that love is God. Since God is love and this man loves this man, then it has to be of God for them to have a homosexual relationship because God is love. And they want to make the love of God above every other attribute of God. And in fact, every church you go to, what you hear is God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, right? God loves you, has a plan for your life. God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And it was interesting, I, I never knew this, heard it on the documentary last night. I'd already been planning on preaching this, but I heard it in the documentary. Do you know how many times in the book of Matthew, the Bible says, talks about the Father's love for us? Zero. In the book of Luke, or Mark, you know how many times? Zero. In the book of Luke, do you know how many times? Zero. It is not until John 3, 16, where it says, God so loved the world. We made the love of God the highest thing. 
But even the angels, I'm going to smack. Some are going to get mad at me. Lock the doors. Don't let them run. Some are going to get mad. The love of God is not the highest quality of God. The angels do not spend eternity around the throne saying love, love, love. They spend eternity crying holy, holy, holy. Because you cannot have the true love of God, the love of God apart from the holiness of God. Amen. But we've allowed the world to redefine love from this thing that proceeds from the holiness of God to be something that is only a matter of emotion or even sexual attraction. And we call that love. And then we say God is love, therefore love is God. Therefore, if it's love, if we call it love, then it must be God. Yeah. When we stood up, when I stood up and I, I, when I speak prophetically to people, when I began to warn about the churches staying closed, and I said, you need to get back open. I warned them what was coming. You know what people said to me? Steve, you're not being very loving. You're not being very loving. You're putting people at risk. The only risk a Christian has, or someone that comes to church has, is if they're not walking with God and they die and go to hell. Right. Right. Hello? Amen. What risk? Oh, death, oh, where, oh, death, where is your sting? What risk is there to a Christian? But when we're focused on the things in this world and we're so entangled in our happiness and the happiness of others in this world and we're not focused on the eternal purpose of God and the kingdom that is to come, then we get wrapped up and distracted. Then we get wrapped up and we're subject to deception because the deception empowers our distractions. Man's concept of love. Second, are you ready for this? Man's concept of equality. We're hearing that a lot today. We each have value as an individual creation of God. We all have value. God is no respecter of persons. Come on, amen? One gender, one race, one nationality. It's not, it does not have more value in the heart of God than another. However, God never promised or promotes equality of outcome. Never one time in Scripture. The very foundation of socialism, communism, is, is totally opposite to scripture. Sow a little, reap a little. Sow bountifully, reap bountifully. Sow to the flesh, reap destruction. Huh? Sow to the spirit, reap everlasting life. Uh, hello? If you don't work, you don't get to eat. Oh, there it is. But what we're hearing is, no, 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 it's not fair. Everybody needs to have equality of outcome. It has never been, never will be. Do you realize God is not that way? Do you realize even heaven is not that way? Everybody's not equal in heaven? Huh? Some are going to have thrones. Some are going to make it in with nothing. That's what the Bible says. All their life, their works are going to be burned up in fire. And only because they had saving faith in Christ did they even make it in. But there will be the least, uh-oh, the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're praying. Jesus told us to pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If in heaven there are least and greatest, then on earth there will be least and greatest. And that's God's way. So any talk outside of that is demonic. And it's promoted, and it's why it never one time has worked. Because when people who promote this get people to follow them and become in power, they become the powerful and the weak stay weaker. It always happens because it can't work, because it's contrary to the kingdom principles. Are y'all hearing me? Communists and socialism can never, ever, 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 ever work. Because it is a curse by God. Because it's contrary to his kingdom. Huh? We say, oh, but it's fair. God isn't fair. He's just. Huh? He's just. And that's the third one. Man's concept of justice. Modern man wants everything to be fair. 
in their in my idea, but what's fair to them? Because what's fair to him ain't right fair to her. Right. <laughs> Modern ideas of fairness and God's justice are two completely different things. Fairness has to do with subjective concept of equality without regard to good works. I'm going to say that again. Fairness has to deal with a subjective concept of equality without uh, regard to how they live their life, to the works they do. Well, it's not fair. Let's pick something out of the headlines. It's not fair that Leah Thompson, this transgender, quote unquote, man, woman, whatever it was, was a man, now supposed to be a woman, is that she's not able, he's not able to compete in women's sports because he believes he's a woman. And so NCAA and all these other, let it, shh, wait a minute, the same people that promoted women's rights are now allowing a man to steal a woman's right to win? Because it's under fairness, it's under equality, it's under, it's under the emotions, and these things are even being preached in the church. Because the devil knows if the church can go down the way of destruction, of deception, we lose our power. Huh? Justice is freedom. Biblical justice is freedom from favoritism, from self-interest, from bias and deception, especially conforming to an established standards or rules. In other words, to obey God's word. There is no justice outside of the word of God. God is just to send a sinner to hell. Why well, would but we redefine love? How could a loving God send anybody to hell? And I say, how could a just God allow anybody to get out? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is only by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid the price. So God is just in extending salvation to us as we rely and depend and believe on Him and Him alone. You cannot have justice and violate the Word of God. They're contrary to each other. The Lord spoke to me when George Floyd was murdered. And he was murdered. I saw it. I saw it in a vision before I even saw it on TV. I saw the murderous spirit get into that police officer's eyes. I don't believe he intended from the beginning, but a murderous spirit. He began blind to what was happening, and it released a demon all, all over this country. And now we see this thing that went on. But the Lord spoke to me. He said, "They're crying out for justice." But you tell my people, there will be no justice until there comes justice for the unborn. You cannot promote the murder of the most innocent and then demand justice for somebody else. Justice has no favoritism. You don't favor this one over that one. Justice is justice. Are there injustices? Yes, in the world. But it's not the system that is unjust. In fact, our system is designed to allow for justice. It's unjust people who refuse to follow the word of God. Under the guise of justice, they're releasing criminals in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago. They're letting them go out right now. And 70% of them are recommitting the same kind of crimes. Why? Because that's not justice. Justice is, is obeying the word of God. Now, if you obey the word of God, you can't be a racist. Because if you look down on somebody because of their race or gender, you, if you judge them as less than, you are not obeying the word of God. The Bible says, he says, he says, prefer one another above yourself. You're denying the word of God. Greater love has no man than this except he lay his life down. See, racism cannot, racism can exist in a church when a church doesn't obey the word of God. Just because you claim to obey parts of the word of God doesn't mean you're obeying all the word of God. Huh? When you get the hold of the mind of God, you begin to look at everyone that is born again. You begin to look at everyone and you begin to say, that's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, come on. <sighs> yeah. How, <laughs> how 
will you treat the temple of the Holy Ghost? If Jesus himself came right here, right now, let's say even the Apostle Paul, so full of the Holy Ghost, how would we honor him and treat him? Every little brother and sister, even the weakest, poor, on welfare, the one that's least educated, but they love Jesus, they are the temple of God. And I better treat them as such. Temple of God. Who am I to even think for a second God chose a wrong temple? That's real justice. But the great injustice that's sweeping through our country, the injustice is not because of the, 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 the foundation of the country or systemic this or systemic racism or all that. It's founded in that the church has gotten away from the word of God. Huh? And many of pulpits have preached much injustice. They preached it. They preached and promoted racism and justified it. And now they're preaching the opposite. What's well, still racism? It used to be racism against black people and Hispanic people. Now it's racism against white people. I mean, think about it for a moment. If I would have stood up here and said, well, you need to deny your brownness, your brown privilege, your black privilege. He said, oh, there's no such thing. Go, go, go to Africa. I'm the only white guy there. <laughs> went in most of the places I go. So much so they hadn't even seen what place we went this last trip. They hadn't even seen a white person before. The kids had never even seen a white person before. See, it's not about that. Are you all hearing me? It's the same demon spirit. It just it shifts. It's the same demon. The reason I hate all this white privilege lies is because I hate racism. And I hate all this thing that black people are lesser or dumb. I hate it. It's a lie. Right. My God, it's a lie. Yeah. We all came from Adam and Eve. Right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. We got to see that. And the justice of God demands that I deal with you when you're born again as the child, as the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you're not born again, I deal with you as a potential member of the bride. And I'm going to do everything to show you the love and the mercy and the justice of God so that you will respond to him Amen. and become a part of the family. Yeah. Woo! Ah, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. What time do I have till? Because I'm not even close, but... I, I, I have till 12? Yes, well, we're going past that. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to pick up tonight on the rest of it, but let me get through this. Ephesians chapter 4. Are y'all getting something? Yes. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. You have to understand that the, 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 the lies, the deceit that's coming out, the narrative that even churches are taking up is not the gospel. Right. The gospel is the answer. True. Come on. I'm saying, ever say the gospel is the answer. Yeah. Say to say the gospel's the answer. Say to say the gospel's the answer. And when you love the gospel, you will hate injustice in every form. And if you're a soldier of Christ, you will fight true injustice. But you also have the discernment to the deception. I don't march with socialists who their entire agenda is to get rid of uh, cisgender comes concepts, which is that there's two genders. Their whole agenda is to destroy the nuclear family. It's actually in their plan and in their indoctrination that's going through it. That's why I don't support BLM, Black Lives Matter, because it's not about black young men. It's about using some genuine real issues to pervert and manipulate a people and, and to bring in socialist doctrines. That's what it's about. Understand it. The two of the three founders are, are de dedicated, avowed, trained Marxists. They said it with their own words. Why are we going to follow the ideology that killed 120 million people? More than anything, any ideology in the history of the world died under socialism and communism. It is not being political to call that out. It is fighting for righteousness. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, Ms. Karen, if you come, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Huh. Let's go back to verse uh, 
3 through 5, and watch what he's talking about. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. Do not be deceived. Don't be partakers with them. For the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So don't minimize sexual sin. Hello? Don't promote gay marriage. Don't be partakers with them. Boy, it's quiet. Huh? Don't be engaged in filthiness. Covetousness. Don't be like the world chasing after just, oh, I gotta have the newest thing. I gotta have the newest this. I gotta have the newest that. No, your whole drive is, Lord, what do I need to be most effective in my mission? Which is to advance the kingdom of heaven. Which is, I just bought a, a newer RV. It's a little bigger. It has more capacity to bring more people. It has more storage capacity. It's a diesel pusher. It's a big investment. Now, I could have got by with the other one. But this is a good, the, the things that I can bring with this, it, this allows me to go to more places, longer, better. It makes me more effective. Come on, amen. Nothing wrong. Do you understand it? That's okay. God, but why? I'm after the kingdom. I'm after, I'm after what is best, what helps me be most effective for the kingdom. I'm not caught up in covetousness. So I'm not going to lust for this, what this person has. Well, they have a nicer house. They have a nicer car. They have a bigger ministry. All these other things. The church is driven. Do you know why so much compromise has happened from the pulpit? Because so many pastors are so insecure, they covet to have a mega ministry. So they're willing to compromise the gospel to get more people in the pews. So they have a bigger crowd. So they can say, well, I got 3,000. Yeah, look at me. I have five locations. We broadcast live. They all get to sit there and watch me on a TV because I'm so wonderful. While we've got all these other young ministers that have no platform because one superstar has hogged up all the, all the pulpit time because it's all got to be about him. We're not even thinking generationally. We're not thinking about training up and raising up an army. We're, 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 we're after building a personality. And we've seen it time again. What happens when the personality goes? Boom! Usually the thing blows apart. Because we're not think we're coveting. We want to be the guy instead of be the one I must decrease, he might that he might increase. I'm willing to, to I'm willing to use the platform God's given me to lift others up and to promote them huh? and develop them so that they can go on. So that there's many, many, many more of us out there doing it. Right. Amen. Let me keep going. Nor foolish talking or coarse jesting. Of course, jesting is, is uh, sexual jokes. Foolish talking, you know what it actually means? It actually speaks about a person who just tries to make everything funny. I love being funny. That's, I look funny, so that's funny. I love being funny. Then it's, humor has a place. But how many know there's some people that just want to make light of everything? God says avoid that. Because I actually lead you into more ungodliness. For this you know, he says, or which is not fitting, but rather giving thanks to God. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. The gospel. Jesus loves you, but that doesn't mean you're automatically in. He's a God of justice. He says, the uncleanness, it's got to go. The coveting, the lusting for the things, it's got to go. The impurity in our minds, our emotions, it's got to go. And the only way to go, it goes, is through repentance. The message of Jesus is still the message of the kingdom today. Repent. For the kingdom, the authority, the government of God is at hand. And that is the message. And to water that down in any way is to fall under the spirit of deception. We're no longer running according to the rules, which the analogy in 2 Timothy then declares, you can't win. 
if you don't run the race according to the rules. It doesn't matter how much everybody likes you. It doesn't matter how much you're seen as a tolerant Christian. You can't win the race. You can't finish the race. You can't win if you don't follow the rules.